Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to continue uh, learning how to name ionic compounds. Today we're talking about polyatomics. The polyatomics really aren't that difficult to use or deal with. You'll definitely want to have a common polyatomic chart handy though. You can find one of these on the internet. You know, make sure that you have uh, something available so you know what some of the charges are on these polyatomics so we can name them. But, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. What is a polyatomic? A polyatomic is simply two or more atoms uh, that ha are, even though they are covalently bonded, they function as a single ion. Uh, these are typically anions, uh, although they can be cations too. The typical cation, of course, being ammonium. You'll see a lot of that. Um, but uh, anions, you think it's things like carbonate, chlorate, things like that. Uh, and, and again, get a common list of these and you'll have that as a resource for you later. Um, they pretty much follow the same uh, rules as binary compounds. Again, they have to be electrically neutral um, and uh, they have to be balanced charged, things like that. Of course, these are not called posse atomics, but... But if it helps you remember what they are, feel free. <laughs> The IUPAC, of course, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd <coughs> show you a little story about how these things uh, form. Uh, now, some of this stuff might be a little advanced based on where you might be in terms of curriculum. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, the atoms want to get together and form full outer shells. Carbon starts with four. Each of the oxygens start with six. And so what they'll try to do, since they're all nonmetals, is they'll try to share their way to a full outer shell. Uh, but that didn't get anybody eight valence electrons. And so what these things can do is form what's called a double bond. And that's where they kind of uh, shift electrons around and they have four electrons between any two atoms. And so that's what we'll do here. We'll go ahead and make a double bond here. Now you'll notice that the oxygen on the left now has eight and the carbon in the middle now has eight. But the other two oxygens are not at a complete valence shell. And so they're going to have to pick up some more electrons. And that's where some other atom comes in. So what they'll do is they'll go over there and take uh, electrons off him. And then as a group, they have a negative two charge. And so uh, really you don't know who ended up taking the electrons. It's just the polyatomic took them. And so polyatomics as a group, although they covalently bonded, they gained or lost additional electrons to become stable, to get everybody to full outer shells. And so when we talk, for instance, about carbonate, um, that's how it comes. It comes in that CO3 with a negative 2 charge. And that's where posse atomics come from. So let's show how we actually use these in a named compound now. And so really the only thing you have to remember is, so here's our carbonate here. That's how we typically write it. All right, just come on over there, negative 2 charge. Now, the only thing you really have to take into account is the fact that uh, you can't change the subscripts that come with polyatomics. So that three that comes with after the O, that's stuck there. The carbonate comes off the shelf as CO3 glued together. Uh, and there's nothing you can do about that. And so don't ever change the subscripts of a polyatomic. If you end up having more than one of a polyatomic, uh, then uh, you simply put a uh, parentheses there so that uh, that subscript gets distributed throughout everything in the number. For instance, if we take gallium carbonate and crisscross this down, um, we'd have two galliums and three carbonates. Now with that three on the outside, that actually might look like a 33 if it wasn't color and font, so we end up throwing parentheses in there. So whenever you have more than one of a polyatomic, uh, you use the, sub, uh, use the parentheses to make sure that the uh, polyatomic stays together. So it's really pretty straightforward. And again, as these guys point out, we need that subscript to apply to everything in there. And so that's why we need the parentheses there. Now, don't break up the polyatomics. Now, uh, one of the things you really have to know is uh, how to distinguish between different polyatomics that have different numbers of oxygen. And you'll see this a lot if you look at any common ion sheet you'll see a lot of polyatomics that contain oxygen. Now the most typical polyatomic that contains oxygen is giving the ending 8, A-T-E, 8. For example, with chlorate, uh, it would be ClO3 minus. Um, if it has one more oxygen than that, it would be like per 8. So like per chlorate, ClO4 minus. Uh, you can think of like uh, peroxide too that has one additional oxygen. 
any of that means one additional. Uh, one less would be ite, so like chlorite, ClO2 minus, and then two less would be hypoite. So hypochlorite would be ClO minus. Now notice the charge didn't change, just the number of oxygens did. And that's it. You really do have to memorize this. There's no way around this. Uh, so take the time you know, to know that per eight, 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 hypo eight. It's really not that hard to memorize. And then you can scale up and down. And that means that there's even less that you need to memorize, as Question Bear points out. Now remember that all eights are not three oxygens. And you can either, there's certainly patterns on the periodic table that you can memorize, or you can just memorize which ones are three and which ones are four. It's, it's up to you. You know, you decide how you want to spend your time. But once you know one of them, you can scale up and down from there. And you really need to memorize. This, this page is super important because once we get to acids, which we'll do next, uh, if you don't have your polyatomics really down pat, uh, you'll butcher the acids because it's more complex than this. So, uh, as before, go ahead, uh, pause the video and work through these examples. I'll wait for you. Okay, welcome back. Aluminum sulfate, that's an Al3+. Plus. It's sulfate SO4 2 minus, so we crisscross those down. Uh, so we needed three sulfates there. Again, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. There's nothing different between that and aluminum oxide, all right? except in this case, sulfate uh, is, is a bigger group of atoms as opposed to just an oxygen. But it, it would, it's the same sort of idea. Magnesium hydroxide. Be careful with hydroxides because uh, since there's no subscript at the end of the polyatomic, it doesn't look that bad if you don't put parentheses down. Uh, obviously with the sulfate in the first example, if you don't put the parentheses down there, it's probably not 43. But if you forget the parentheses here, it just looks like OH2. Uh, and so be really, really careful about your, uh, your hydroxide polyatomic. Acetate, copper two acetate looks tough, but it's not. Acetate has a minus one charge based on your carbon ion chart. Uh, and so I'll need two acetates to balance out one copper two. Now the one on the bottom there, uh, that's a tricky one. You notice that it's at two two. You'd think that would have reduced, but it didn't. I'd say that's a big red flag, that that's uh, something weird going on there. And so if you look at your common ion chart, you'll see that uh, there's peroxide. And peroxide is a uh, O2 with a negative two charge. Just like oxide, it would be peroxide one additional oxide. And so that's, that's a sneaky polyatomic. Um, you have to be careful about that. And I, there's another, there's a mercury polyatomic that's tricky too, because again, it's only one element. So be careful about that. So that's a formula for hydrogen peroxide right there. In the next example here, uh, that would be iron three arsenate. And again, you have to figure out, okay, well, arsenate has a negative three charge. And so that iron must have a positive three charge to cancel that out. And then finally, in the last case, that would be lead two phosphate. Um, so we are using some of the up over down techniques we learned last time. We have to figure out the charge of multiple charge cations if we need to. And now we're adding in the polyatomics. So it's getting a little bit more complex, but nothing that you can't handle with some practice. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's all we're going to do today. Again, don't break up those polyatomics. Yeah, a chem student will uh, break their leg if you do that. Yeah. And so, you know, go through that again if you need to. Uh, take a look at those, but just practice. Uh, you can you can just combine things, make up compounds that might not even exist, but just work on uh, you know taking cations and anions and combining them together and seeing what the formulas would be, especially working with the polyatomics. Once you've mastered that, we'll see you next time, and then we'll talk about how to name acids, which is a step beyond this. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.